Hi, welcome to Dream Talk Radio. I'm your host, Anne Hill, and today I have the privilege of talking with Joyce Rocher. Joyce holds an MBA from Columbia University. She has been a trailblazer in the corporate world for over 25 years. She's former president and CEO of Girls Incorporated and sits on the board of numerous, the board of directors of numerous uh, businesses, and she is the author most recently of The Empress Has No Clothes, Conquering Self-Doubt, to embrace success. Joyce, welcome to Dream Talk Radio. Thanks a lot, Anne. Glad to be here. I'm, you know, when I when I saw your book and I read it, I was just so thrilled to have your voice in the conversation because um, there's a lot of of talk now, especially about you know women and the glass ceiling and how that is uh, in various sectors. And you you have a a story that goes back decades and I guess uh, my first question is why don't you fill in um, our listeners who haven't read your book how did you start on the path towards a career in executive leadership basically well I didn't really start there I thought I actually was going to be a math teacher um, that's what uh, my undergraduate degree is in and just opportunities uh, surfaced, uh, and I heard about business school really through a guy that I was dating who was going and thought that this would be something I should at least investigate. And when I went, uh, I was accepted at Columbia, and when I went to Columbia, I um, took marketing courses, and that really set me on the path with, of my career. Uh, I fell in love with, uh, with the marketing discipline, and, uh, and that, you know, that's how I, I started in the corporate world. Um, my first uh, corporate uh, marketing job was with Avon. Mm -hmm. And I started in an entry-level position there and um, moved up through the marketing organization. I was with Avon almost 19 years before I left. I spent, I did take a bit of a break in between for two years at Revlon and, and headed up uh, uh, marketing uh, for the Revlon brand. And then went back to Avon and uh, um, was, um, you know, had an, a numerous opportunities. Um, one, I led the U.S. marketing organization, then ultimately the global organization. And after almost 19 years, I felt like I was ready for something uh, different. And I left the company and ended up um, going to, uh, with an investor group that, that had purchased a hair care company in Savannah, Georgia. And I joined up with this investor group uh, and was president of that company. It was called Carson Products uh, in Savannah. And I was with them a little over four years and then left and decided I thought I was going to do another corporate assignment, actually. And, but I was going to take some time because I really didn't take any time between uh, Avon and going with Carson. I was looking at other opportunities, but not a break. So in the midst of that break, I decided... Um, that I was going to do something for some organizations whose boards I sat on because I never felt throughout my career I ever really had the time to do anything except maybe chair a dinner or something like that. So I did, and I got very intrigued with the nonprofit sector. And, um, and I was uh, talking to someone who had put me on my first corporate board, a, a recruiter, and, uh, and because her firm did uh, nonprofit and board searches. And Gave, you know, just said there weren't a lot of people making a change from corporate, senior executives from corporate into nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And um, I told her I, I was getting intrigued with the sector. And so she gave me a lot of encouragement, a lot of reality checks in that, and said, well, what would be the right organization? And I said, I can't give, I'm not going to give you a name, but I can tell you what my passion would be. Mm -hmm. And I said it was either dealing with education and our women and girls issues. And uh, she ended up having the search for Girls Incorporated, and that's how I uh, moved out of corporate into nonprofit and was CEO for Girls Inc. for 10 years. Wow. And live to tell the tale. Is the, is, <laughs> <laughs> did, did retirement for you somewhat coincide with the desire to put your, your story out in print, or was that a sort of a concurrent uh, thought that you had? Well, it was interesting. Um, and, and my husband will, will beg to differ with you that I retired. That's why I always say I stepped out. Because <laughs> but anyway, um, in 2005, I left Girls Inc. and in, in, uh, joined them in 2000. And I left in 2010. But in 2005, uh, I was approached by Ellen Spragan, 
who uh, was a Fortune small business writer, and she was doing a book called What I Know Now, Letters to My Younger Self. And Ellen approached me because she wanted to give some of the proceeds to Girls Inc. And she said, well, tell me your story. And I said, well, you know, this is really a career change for me. And I told her about my corporate life. And she said, oh, my gosh, you need to be in this book. And what she had done was she interviewed 30 women from all different walks of life, Madeleine Albrecht, Queen Noor, um, uh, Eileen Fisher. And she asked all of the women in the book this question. She said, if you could speak with your 30-year-old self with the knowledge that you have today, what would you say? And it was just mind-boggling for me because it was almost like I was transported back to my corporate time. And I could actually feel how I felt during that time of questioning my abilities and questioning everything. And, and while I was being successful, I never really felt comfortable in the role because I always felt that each promotion was just one step before I would stumble and then there would be everybody saying, oh, I knew she wasn't as smart as we thought she was. We knew she should, we shouldn't have given her that chance. We knew she couldn't cut it. And so, you know, I never enjoyed the success I was experiencing because of the self-doubt. Well, when I, when I contributed to Ellen's book and her book was published, um, I, it, three letters from her book were reprinted in O Magazine, and mine was one of the three. And when it did, I got numerous emails and letters from people saying, oh, my God, you're telling my story. You need to do a book. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really think about it until I stepped down from Girls Inc., but it always stayed with me. And after I, was down, after I left, after about six months, I said, you know, if I could try – and understand my own journey and understand how I learned how to quiet that voice because I'm very intentional in saying it doesn't go away. You just learn how to quiet it. And um, that if I could understand that and I could explain that in a book and it could be helpful to others, then it would be well worth doing a book. And so um, I, you know, when I left, I thought about it and my former director of communications had collaborated on nine prior books. And he said, he had said to me, if you ever want to do this book, I'd love to work with you. So he knew the, the journey of how to do a book. I had no idea of writing proposals, et cetera, getting a, you know, a, a publisher, et cetera. And uh, so I sat down to do this book and, uh, and he was great because he, in a sense, pulled out of me my journey. But one of the things I did as I was thinking about this was just thinking how it was an aha for me that something I thought was, which was, I thought was a personal flaw was something that many other people experienced. And one of the people who told me that was the, C, the former CEO of AT&T, the retired CEO of AT&T, when he saw the article in O and he said, you know, Joyce, I dealt with this my entire career. He said, and that blew me away because, you know, you never would have known. And that's what people say to me. Oh, I never would have guessed that you had any doubt. Well, this Ed Whitaker is his name. I just felt there's no way uh, that he ever had any self-doubt. And so I thought it would make the book a lot richer if I could get stories from other people who people would recognize who were successful in their career and can contribute their experiences. So that's how I got on this road to doing the book. And, um, and it's been resonating very uh, dramatically with people since then. Yeah, I mean, I literally can't think of a single woman I know who hasn't experienced imposter syndrome. And that's kind of across disciplines, across age ranges. And I, I want to kind of go into a little bit of the different ways in which imposter syndrome can kind of blindside us. I mean, you growing up sort of lower income, New Orleans, uh, nobody in your family had was telling you, yeah, you can go do this. You know, kind of you said you were, became a, a school teacher and I actually did too. I went to education and I remember uh, my father telling one of his friends that I was I was getting a teaching credential and and the friend saying she's too smart to be a teacher but I I didn't have, you know nobody was telling me that at the time I was making those decisions I just thought well I get better get something safe um, yeah. and you talk about in college the fact that you were black the fact that you're a woman all of these you know had their various 
uh, sort of headwinds on your progress, but that it was the class awareness that really kind of threw you for a loop in college. Can you talk about a little, like unpack a little bit if you can, those different ways that that you came up against the imposter syndrome? Well, you know, and as I didn't know any of this, and as I started working on the book, and by the way, I reached out to one of the two women who had done the original research on the imposter, what they call the imposter phenomena, and that was uh, Dr. Pauline Clance, and she and Dr. Um, Ives did this book in the 70s, so I saw her website, and I reached out to Dr. Clance, and she was wonderful, because I was not a researcher, and I wasn't trying to make this a research book, sure. but I did want to understand what I, was going, what I was going through, and I wanted to understand the stories I was hearing from other people, and one of the things that struck me was that there are triggers to the imposter syndrome. And the triggers happen whenever you are different from the majority of the people who you're either competing against, engaged with in some way, um, you know, that that's what starts to create the self-doubt. So, um, you know, for me, um, being uh, African-American, when I went to Columbia, uh, there weren't, you know, there were a handful of us in the business school at that time. And in any one class that I was in, I was usually either the only one in that class, uh, or maybe there were two, but usually it was just one. So, and I had always gone to, when I grew up, as you said, I grew up in New Orleans, family didn't have a lot of money, I got a scholarship and loans to go to Dillard, uh, which was a private uh, liberal arts school in New Orleans, but it was a historically black college, so I'd never competed in a majority institution. So here I was, one, in New York, in a uh, majority institution in Columbia and competing against people I never, you know, didn't look like me and I never competed against before. And, you know, in growing up in the South, when I did, you still had that message of the expectation that you're, you maybe aren't getting as good an educational background. You may not be as smart. So when I went to Columbia, that doubt played out big time for me. You know, you're in these big lecture halls mm -hmm. and there I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I got in here probably by a fluke and I'm going to say something really dumb and they're going to realize that I'm not supposed to be here. And then I'm going to be packing, you know, heading back to New Orleans. Well, you know, that caused me to hold my head down, uh, be very quiet in class just because I didn't want to say anything that would give credence to the fact that I, that I felt how I was feeling that I didn't deserve to be there. But I did well at Columbia, uh, but that didn't, that didn't waylay the fear. So that's one example. Um, and as I talked to, you know, like a Debbie Lee, um, she had a similar kind of experience at Harvard Law School. <clears throat> um, the, you know, the other thing is uh, being a woman in a majority, I mean, in a predominantly male environment, that will be a trigger for the imposter syndrome. So when I started at Avon, um, there weren't a lot of women in the marketing department. And in fact, there in the merchandising department that I started in, there were only four other women and one started the same day that I did. So here we were, uh, like these strange animals, trying to find our grounding with no role models and trying to, you know, find our way and thinking that, you know, that anything that we said was going to be the thing that was going to get us kicked out, you know, that it would show that we really didn't have what it took to be there. So, you know, so again, that trigger, because what you're thinking is that for us, that would be a, ma a woman in a male, the predominantly male environment, that the guys are thinking, well, she's not as smart as we are. Mm -hmm. You know, she's probably not a good leader. She doesn't have the kind of experiences. You know, she, you know, she doesn't have the strategic thinking processes. And so, you know, again, early in my career, um, I would sit back in meetings and be quiet and you know we'd be talking about a marketing question and i would be so concerned you know that ah, we'd be discussing something and i'd have an answer but i'd roll it around in my brain to you know make sure every dot, every t was crossed every i was dotted before i gave myself the luxury of speaking out because i said oh my gosh if i if it's wrong they're going to say oh how could she be so dumb well you know i did learn that lesson early i said you know if i think by sitting here being quiet that uh, I'm giving credence that I don't know very much. So I had to take the risk and begin to speak out. But again, that's just a demonstration of that. 
yeah. you know, growing up and, you know, without a lot of money. And I heard that from, you know, and you mentioned women, but men have this as well. Uh, and I was wondering how Ed Whitaker, you know, had it, the CEO of AT&T. He grew up in a family of limited means. And that was one of the things that struck me. Here you are in a position and all of a sudden you're competing with people who you believe grew up with a lot of resources family probably talked about you know the stock market over the uh, over the breakfast table right. and here you are in that kind of environment and you're questioning do i fit am i accepted and am i acceptable you know so those are the kinds of things that demonstrated throughout you know and i realized as i went through this personal journey it really started, uh, I can recognize, and I talk about it in the book, when I was in high school. I went to a high school that was one where you had to, uh, it was a public school, but you had to apply to go to it. So most of the students in there, their parents were, um, you know, doctors or teachers or, or nurses or whatever. And my mom was a domestic. You know, my father had died when I was very young through, you know, with a hit and run accident. And, you know, I always felt like I didn't quite, because I, you know, I didn't quite fit in there. So those are the kinds of things that create that self-doubt that makes you question whether or not you fit and whether or not you are accepted or acceptable in those environments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, you talk about um, the, the sort of the double bind of being in that situation where I think uh, you say the fear of being seen as playing it safe is just as bad as the fear of failing if you if yeah. you speak up and and that's that's such a double bind um and i wanted to bring up you mentioned one of my favorite quotes really uh it's cory booker talks about having you have to be able to metabolize your blessings you know at a certain yeah. point you actually have to kind of let them in and and and, and sort of um, embody them in some way. And how, what was that process like for you? How did you finally learn to, I mean, it sounds like you were uh, the recipient of some remarkable self-coaching all the way through, <laughs> you, you know, noticing that, that you were hindering yourself by not speaking up so on and so forth. And, and, you know, forcing yourself in some ways to take the risks, even while there was this internal fear. Um, how did you sort of, what was that transformation like for you to, to really being able to accept what the success that was coming your way, that you were fighting well, for, I should say? I was about to say, actually, I guess I'm still on that journey. Well, but yeah, I love that quote from uh, Cory Booker because that's one of the things as I started to learn more about this, and, and one of the, about the imposter syndrome, one of the things that we do, those of us who suffer with it, when somebody says that was a great job you know you you know you really killed it on that and we are so self-conscious about accepting that and we think that you know, there's just the, the the pendulum is going to drop right after that mm -hmm. that we deflect it and we all make excuses and you know we you know we start with oh it wasn't a big deal oh i was just lucky um and so one of the things as i talk about you know in terms of learning this, it, learning how to, how to manage this self-doubt, how to quiet that voice, is to learn how to just accept those kinds of things. You know, don't just force yourself not to talk and just say thank you. Mm -hmm. And allow it to come in because one of the things that uh, with the imposter syndrome, you're constantly searching for external validation. That's what this is all about. Mm -hmm. And so if you can learn how to ultimately begin to internally validate yourself and why, and that's one of the ways is listen when somebody is telling you about something you did well and internalize it, uh, you know, or just, you know, being learning, it's easy for us to criticize what we don't do well, mm -hmm. but also think about and learn how to put on the, on the ledger in a sense, the things we do do well because we discount them very, very quickly and very easily. So all of that is about internally validating yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so true. And um, you talk about the, uh, the in different uh, arenas, you know, forcing yourself to sort of get into different, uh, taking risks, but then somehow the, the, um, 
the fear grows grows bigger um, at the same time. And I I was curious. Also, you you know you've been working with Girls Inc. and working mm-hmm. with young women, and you talk a lot in the book about how much more difficult it is for younger women uh, to 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 feel like some you know it's okay after a couple different generations of feminism they now they feel like they have to um they have to know all this stuff already and they already have oh. to be over themselves and uh, mm-hmm. you know that even that is familiar to me because i've you know growing up in um, as part of second wave feminism thinking okay now i really i i should be able to have this all i should be able to do this you know be yeah. a, have a career have a fan you know da, 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 tick off all the boxes fill up all the little <laughs> the boxes on my bingo card and so what do you see as the differences between our generation and the younger generation of women coming up well that you know i think you just articulated one of the big differences when you asked me about um how did i get on the road well my lens was very narrow you know in terms of what i could do and so it was you know it within that narrow arena and then basically being open to opportunities as they started to. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, I think. Oh, you're... you can be anything. You know, you can be um, a, a, an astronaut. We talk with the girls because we did a lot of research with them. You know, you can be a scientist. You can be a computer science. You can right. be. You can be an astronaut. You can do this. You can do that. You can do this. But the thing that also for the girls that that we heard back from them was that I'm expected to be able to be all of this, but by the same time, I have to be sweet and I've got to be feminine because the feminine roles don't go away. Yeah. So you have that expectation. It's, it's almost like you have this whole world open to you and almost it's almost like if you don't do well, you're a failure. Right. You know, you, you're not even allowed to be able to, decide in a sense to some degree because it's almost like well you've got all these opportunities what's the big deal we had to fight for these opportunities well it is a big deal and then often you know it would be great if we could say with all of the progress and there has been great progress that things were equal well they're not so you're going to hit those times where in fact you're still in many instances going to be one or one of a very few women in an environment uh, and there will be questions surrounding you in that environment, questions around whether or not you can cut it. Mm-hmm. So while the world is telling you that, yeah, it's it, you know, you got you guys have it now, the society is saying, hey, not so fast. So mm-hmm. it really is a conundrum that women today are living in. And as I've spoken about this, in fact, when I started to do the book, one person who ended up not being interviewed, well, she didn't want to be in the book, uh, even though someone had suggested she might be a good subject. Uh, and it wasn't anybody I knew personally. The good thing is everybody who's in there I knew personally, so it was a lot easier having the conversation. Um, but she said, oh, that was something that women dealt with, you know, in your generation. And it's been amazing as I've been speaking at companies, at law firms, it is not a generational thing. You still find that, and yet you've got this world around you that's saying, oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. It's okay. Everything is fine. You know, you just have to prove yourself. Well, sometimes, and that was one of the things we said at Girls, Inc., um, you know, um, we would say our mission is empowered girls and a big, fat, and an equitable society uh-huh. because you are a girl, but if the society is not ready for that person, or is not open to providing the full opportunity, she's going to bang her head against the wall constantly. And unfortunately, many, because they've been told this, are not prepared when it does happen. And that's even harder. Mm. That's a really, um, good, the really good point. I, you know, I, one of the surprising things to me about getting older and being in middle age is how much freedom I feel uh, and I don't know if the, I may tell me if this is your experience. I, I feel like as a middle-aged woman, I can I pretty much have a pass. I can go anywhere. Nobody really questions my existence at any table if I am so bold to sit at it. But they also don't quite know what to make of me, right? <laughs> and right. I'm old enough so that the whole sexual politics of being a younger woman is sort of off the table, or at least it's over to the side significantly. 
And I find that a position of amazing power. I, I can choose, when I do choose to speak up, suddenly my words have more force because I'm sort of this cipher. Uh, nobody really doesn't have any large ex expectations of me, but they, they're not discounting me either. It's kind of this unknown. I, do you have that experience as you're going into well, unfamiliar yeah. places? Well, it's, you know, it's interesting. I talk about once you get to a point you know, where in fact you start to feel that comfort in yourself. And age brings it on as well. And you are, you know, you, you feel like, okay, I do, I, I, I have the experience now. I have the right to be able to have this opinion. You know, I, you know, I don't have to please everybody around me anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so it really is such a relief. It is such a feeling of, of, you know, comfort, it's, it's, a, it's a feeling of, you know, that, you know, uh, the constraints are, the, the chains are off, the constraints are off. Yeah, you're, you're conscious of your environment and you do things within a respect of that environment. But at the same time, you feel like you have equal right to be able to, as you said, make voice that opinion and it may be a different a different opinion mm -hmm. that you have a right to be where you are because you've paid your dues in a sense you've got the experience you you know you you can bring this all of this to the party now yeah. and so it's not about because as you're going through the imposter syndrome and the self-doubt it feels like prove 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 you deserve to be here. Prove you know what you're talking about. Prove you deserve that new promotion. Prove, prove, prove. Well, now you start to feel, okay, I don't have to prove it anymore. And that, that, that feeling is such a blessing. <laughs> it is a blessing. It is. Absolutely. I agree. I agree. <laughs> it, it, it's like we get in our own way so much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to ask you about one more thing, which is, um, you know, I've I've talked to other friends of mine who have been, who have struggled, you know, against uh, in seemingly insurmountable odds, no matter what the situation, and and being victims of prejudice or discrimination of various sorts, and they finally get to a place where, like you say, okay, yeah, I feel like. I'm good here, you know, whether it's I've, I've transitioned to the gender where I feel at home or I'm in this mm -hmm. position where I feel like, okay, I've earned my cred and I'm not ashamed of it. And they get, they talk about this funny thing about it. all of those struggles seem to be invisible so that you walk down the street and somebody just sees you as just another, you know, privileged person. <laughs> you know, you, you can't trail your little, your life story behind you. Did, have you experienced that? And is it ever be so, somewhat jarring to have people um, treat you as though you were you were always you sort of came, you know, out of Zeus's thigh in this full, <laughs> you know, rather than you are the product of all of these years of experience? Do you ever feel that jarring sensation? Uh, no, I have to say that <laughs> I haven't. it's you know I think and. Um, it's be, uh, frankly because I'm African American and I'm a woman, and so and the things that I've been, you know, it blows my mind. So you know, when I think about it, actually, you know, when I think about to this little girl who's growing up in New Orleans, what I've been able to do, it blows my mind. So I think people still are to some degree very, you know, are interested in, you know, how did I grow up? Where, what's even if they haven't read the book? Because I tell people when they read the book, they know everything about me, but. Um, they want to know, you know, what was my journey? How did I get to be able to be on a corporate board? You know, what got you there? What got you to be able to have had, held uh, the positions at, you know, in a corporate world? And then this one at Girls Inc., you know, when we were touching the lives of hundreds of thousands of girls. So, so they are interested in, because they, they want to know what, what allowed you to get on this, on this road. Right. So, um, so I don't have, I haven't had that. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Novelty. Yeah. And and so one more question. I'm actually really curious how your um, you know, your book is great. It's eminently readable. It's got tons of great advice um, for women, men, anybody who's struggling with that that sensation of not being good enough. 
Uh, how was your experience with Barrett Kohler? I've heard great things about them as publishers. Do you oh, feel like they supported the book, you in the book, since it's been out? They were fantastic uh, to work with. Um, you know, I, I don't have a comparison, but I've heard people talk about, you know, um, a publisher changing, you know, um, either uh, the direction they were taking or not supporting them. Mm -hmm. I found them incredible to work with um, and helpful. You know, mm -hmm. that when I started, I felt very strongly about The Empress Has No Clothes because I felt it was a feeling comparable to that, that kid's story. Mm -hmm. That's how you feel, is that you're out there naked, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of this self doubt. Uh, but, they, but I had a different subtitle, and it was, it was called Conquering the Imposter Syndrome. Well, you know, they said, yeah, a lot of people don't know that term. Mm -hmm. and, and I had to realize I had to learn the term when somebody told me what I was describing had this name. So instead of just saying, well, why don't we call it blank? They went through a research, you know, they, we threw, I threw out ideas of subtitles. They, they had their folks throw out ideas of sub subtitles and they, and they did research internally with people who have done, you know, reviewed their books. I added people in my universe to come into that and we got the subtitle that people could understand easily. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with the front of the cover of the book or they had this author's day which is fantastic where you have the opportunity to go in and talk about your book and they've got all of their folks there telling you they're kind of, it's not your editor just saying, okay, I think this needs to be shorter and this is what we've got, but you know, folks telling you what they, how they, their take on it. Mm -hmm. And it really does, it, it's a process of getting it better and better and better. And I've heard that from other people. So they were wonderful to work with. They were yeah. absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, the book is a remarkable resource. Um, I've been talking with Joyce Roche. She's the author of The Empress Has No Clothes, Conquering Self-Doubt to Embrace Success. You're right. That is a really good subtitle. Congratulations on the book. And uh, anything, what's next? Uh, do you have a, a laundry list of a to do list of things? Or is your husband putting his foot down and saying you have to re actually retire someday? <laughs> Well, my the book is keeping me very busy still. Okay. I'm speaking a lot on it, so I'm traveling a lot with the book at companies and conferences. My boards keep me equally as busy, so I haven't had the chance. And then Barrett Cola is talking to me about, well, we need to just start discussing another book. Now, I'm not sure there is, and I said to them, I don't know if there's another book in, in me. There was This was something I felt so passionate about because for me it was such a revelation when I realized that it wasn't just a personal flaw that I had, that it had substance and other people were going through it as well. If I found something that in fact I could fe really feel that I could add a personal perspective to, that it would be additive to folks and would be of value, then yes, I would do it. But without that, I don't think so. But right. it's interesting, I'll never say never. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds like a lesson learned, <laughs> never say yeah. never. Yeah. Uh, That's right. What a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, thank you, it's been fun. It's been All a right. lot of fun. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay.